welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. Now, this is the show where we answer your questions. So if you have a question, please go hashtag Ask GMBN Tech in one of the comments, and hopefully we'll get onto it. As always, please don't forget to like and subscribe whilst you're here, and if you hit that notification bell, you'll be sure to never miss a video. Ding, ding. So let's get going with it. Yeah, first up, I'm throw this one to you, Henry. Oh, cool. Uh, from John Wee. I'm currently running a GX Eagle 12 speed with a 32 tooth chainring. Uh, I'm always on the biggest cog when climbing, so that's a 50 on those, so that is a big old gear. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a sit down and spinner type of rider with slightly bad knees. Sometimes on steeper climbs, I find I'm running out of gears. So now, what is the smallest front chainring I can get away with without excessive wear on the chainring or messing up my rear suspension? Uh, would a 26, 28, or 30 be recommended? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, a well, like you said, a 3250 yep. is typically a small gear, but you know, it's horses for courses. I'm a spinner myself, so I yep. do sympathize. Going down to a 30 tooth would be a big jump. It's, it's a huge jump. It, it's yeah. not like, oh, that's it's not like going up to a 52 tooth on the back. Yeah. It's, it would be very noticeable. Um, in terms of, you know, your suspension kinematics, it will slightly increase your uh, anti squat. Um, but if you make sure just to descend with the cassette in the middle, middle of the block, yeah, you won't, you're not really going to notice. Yeah, I've actually got a 30 on that Canyon Euron I've got. Mm -hmm. um, I'd always be between a 32 and a 34, just for my preferences. Um, got a 30 on it. it, you can literally climb up anything on it, it's mental, but I do find I'm actually running out of gears the other end, yeah. so I might hop back up to a 32. Yeah, on a 32 with SRAM, 3250 is fine for me, yeah. but on a 29er. I personally do lend, lean towards a 30. Yeah. The only thing to watch out for is you've got to look out. Sometimes you get the big oversized stays yeah. in that junction. Sometimes clearance can literally be an issue. It, it, it really is an issue. Of, yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't know what bike you've got, but that's something to watch out for. If you go yeah. to a 28, you might find it just bottoms out on the, on the system. So yeah. Next, we have a question from SM Krauss. And he says, I've got mallet downhill pedals and two of the studs have become mangled and I can't get anything in there to loosen or tighten them at this point. Any tips on how to get these out and some fresh ones in? Um, there's there's lots of different options depending on just how mangled they are, but um, probably the safest bet is there's some sort of locking pliers like mole grips or something like that. Um, you might want to hold your pedals in something sturdy like a vice. Uh, use soft grips, or if you haven't got any, a couple of bits of wood just to uh, clamp down on your pedals so you're not going to scratch it or damage it. Um, and get to work with those mole grips, really. Um, like I said, it does depend on how damaged exactly they are. I mean, I know sometimes you can literally, there'll be like little mangled stumps, <laughs> nothing, nothing left, in which case, yeah, go for it. I think as well, if they're completely been ground flat to yeah. the pedal and they're flush, then an only way I can think of is an easy out, yeah, great which idea. is yeah. is a drill bit that drills opposite, opposite. yeah, and, and then you will, screw it, yeah, up. and it yeah. will bind and, and wind it out. Yeah, um, they are some kind of a, almost a specialist piece of kit, but most bike shops have mm. them. So if you just say, "Hi, how much it costs to get this pin, this pin, this pin out?" Yeah, it probably would be too expensive, and it's a good, good set of pedals. It'd be worth worth saving. Oh, 100 percent, yeah, yeah. And you can get full rebuild kits for those pedals as well, like axles and pins and all that mm. stuff. So yeah, like Henry says, it's definitely worth taking the time to get them out. All right, next up uh, from Lars Anders. Dolly and Henry, loving the show. Recently you discussed cable routing, which of course is an ongoing topic. I've got a carbon cross-country frame with an external reverb dropper post on there. Well, you remember those, the old loop on the outside? Oh yeah, loop, loop. Um, Still got one somewhere. Um, but I'm finding it a bit obtrusive, so I'd like perhaps to, basically wants to do an internal bodge here. Oh, okay. Because my frame is out of warranty and I'm willing to take the risk. Oh. Uh, where on the frame would be the best points to, uh, to enter or exit in order to weaken uh, the integrity of the frame as little as possible. Right. Um, so shall I do the boring bit first? Yeah. Yeah, don't do this. Don't do it. Don't do this. Um, it could be dangerous. But if you're going to do it. Yeah, so shall we do the fun uncle bit? Yeah. Do you like flamethrowers, kids? <laughs> you betcha. <laughs> I mean, in terms of the seat post, I'd say if you can take it down the down tube and put it, you know, how like the new base, base of the seat tube. Uh, base of the seat tube. Yeah. That'd be a good spot. Yeah, it's fairly safe, to be honest. What do you think? I mean, with metal, it's quite, in tubes, it's relatively kind of easy to work out where, for instance, you might think a top tube, well, that doesn't do that much in terms of supporting the frame, but the designers probably knew that and they made it very thin. Yeah. So then when you so weaken it further, the integrity. It, yeah. it's, that's the issue for me. It do you think generally on, on, well, on most frames around the bottom bracket, we call it a yoke area of the bike because all the tubes sort of go into that area. It's normally, there's normally quite a lot of material there. Mm -hmm. 
I actually think you could probably get away with it. Mm. Um, as close as you can, really, to the bottom, I would say. I have actually done it's got this the before. maximum stuff. Oh, you've done it, have you? Yeah, I had a, a customer that just said, no, do it. And I was like, yeah, come on now. No, no seriously. Do it. Yeah. There. I was like, okay. But that was alloy, and you can make it a bit. Yeah. We even got a side entry. It actually yeah. looked pretty good. But... Oh, yeah, I can imagine you can control it a lot more. Mm. Um, honestly, you're on your own with this. Um, if you're going to try it, don't go come running to us if your frame does break, but I reckon you'll be fine yeah. if you were to do it. Um, just take care when you're drilling. Um, because you're drilling carbon and stuff, you don't want any sort of bits going in your eyes and that. So yeah. wear some eyewear, wear some gloves too, because yeah. uh, shower to carbon, that, yeah, mask is a great idea. Um, just take care as you're doing it. Start small and work it out to the correct size, yeah. basically, and file it, make it nice and smooth. Don't give it any options for any cracks or anything to appear. Yeah, it might be worth as well, because your frame probably flexes a bit more than many of us even realise when we're descending. Yeah. And if it is one of those areas that flexes, something like maybe some kind of resin or something to stop it potentially delaminating a bit. That's a good idea. As it almost like pulses under load. Yeah. But cool. Yeah. I, I, no, I've never done it on a carbon frame, so. I, I, but I'd quite happily try it myself. Uh, yeah, if, like, if you, if you, that much of a loose cannon like you're making out, you're gonna have no problems. But we'll say <laughs> it again, don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> Next, we have a question from <laughs> Adam Wetmore, and he says, Ask GMBN Tech, I have a SRAM Elixir 5 hydraulic brake lever, but the bleed screw is stripped. Any suggestions of how to remove that screw? I can't even remember what an Elixir lever looks well, like. To be honest, that was the one that had the taper ball, wasn't it? I think. Yeah, but I from think the end. Has it not got a flip? Can you just flip it over and go on the underneath one? I think you might be right. Yeah, I'd have to have to double check. I've actually got some old ones stashed away, but I'm not using them for so long. Yeah. They're quite a lot different, aren't they, to the juices and guides and all the others. Yeah, they've got a taper ball system that screws straight into the end. I think you're right. I think you probably can flip it over. You can flip it over. If not, I guess, you know, something I've got a set of imperi Imperial Allen keys. Yeah. So not metric sized. Which yeah, are basically cannon fodder for my hammer. Yeah, <laughs> just yeah have so, the same with old uh, Torx keys. Sometimes yeah. you get a Torx key and they just get a little extra bite. Yeah. Um, it's a really low torque bolt as well, so it won't take much to get it out. Um, if in doubt, go to your local bike shop, mate. Yeah, true, true, true. All right, next up's from Daniel Silver. Does degreaser contaminate brake pads? Oof. Uh, this goes a few ways, I think. Isn't it? Yeah, now I would say, personally, I kind of. <laughs> I think this might sound a bit like tin foil hat conspiracy time. I think pretty much anything contaminates. I think brake cleaner contaminates brake pads. I don't put anything on there. I'm I'm with you on putting nothing on them except water. Except water. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that's a bit more of a superstitious thing from my point of view because I've had too many contaminations yeah. in the past. I don't want any chance of anything. Yeah. Getting but there. I think a lot of the time it comes from an automotive or motorcycle side of things. Yeah. And they can because of the higher load and higher temperatures, they yeah. can get away with putting. You know, you could get what you could contaminate a bike pad with is drastically different. Oh yeah, you could, a microscopic amount of grease can yeah. ruin your brake pads. Yeah. And you've seen mechanics who work on cars and change your brake pads, right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> the hands are like black with grease well, and they're just chucking it all on. I was talking to my friend and he was like, and I don't know if this is true, but he said you could literally get a finger full of grease and just wipe on a moto brake rotor and you'd be all right. Don't make any difference, yeah. I guess. Yeah. yeah. So I think that sometimes, you know, a lot of companies do say their degreasers, which I find quite an extraordinary claim, can work on brake pads. And I wouldn't even want to try it. I'd, I'd be... I'd be worried. I, I guess what all those manufacturers, uh, there's obviously lots of them out there, I guess what they're getting to is that their degreasers that they're supplying, they're saying they're safe for use on brake pads, really just means that they don't have any oils and stuff in there. Yeah. Um, but like Henry says, if you want to be completely safe, um, just use water to clean your brake pads. Mm -hmm. um, cleaning your rotors though, you can use our isopropyl alcohol and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Anything that evaporates really is going to be better than um, out and out degreasers, I would say. Um, but yeah, you can't beat a bit of elbow grease and water. Right? Yeah, and it's, it's something I find really crazy is the, you know, people will always say, oh, you can set them on fire. You can, I don't know, do this, that, the other. And I just think the amount that bikes tend to cost and the thing for me that dictates how a bike feels largely is brakes. So for the sake of 15, 20, 25 quid set of pads, you can change how your bike feels or you can be like, you could drive an hour to get somewhere. You could do your first one. Oh no, my brake pads are contaminated. You know what I mean? It's like, it's making your life so much harder. It can ruin your ride. Yeah, just and be careful in the first place. Right. I think we're probably quite alike in this, right? So this is the situation, right? You're riding downhill. Right. You discover your brake pads contaminated. They make the worst howl. Yeah. What do you do? 
do you A, avoid using the brakes and risk having the biggest crash in order <laughs> to get back to the car park without yeah. annoying yourself and being seen, yeah. or B, do you just carry on riding? Oh, I would probably, there's something, there's a strange type of embarrassment that comes when you're riding with people, and every time you touch the brakes, mm -hmm. they can hear you braking, and you're like, oh no! Yeah. <laughs> so I would just get some new pads in there ASAP. What would you do? Uh, yeah, avoid using the brakes and get yeah. to the bottom just of the hill and yeah. change them quick sharp. Just done yeah. and dusted. <laughs> yeah. Uh, next, we have a question from James, sorry, Mark Henderson. I'm getting ahead of myself. And he says, I was wondering if you can run boost on the rear and non boost on the front. Will it mess it up much? Um, no, it won't make any difference. Uh, it's only you're only talking about the axle width spacing. Um, so, Boost is uh, 110 on the front and the original was 100 mil. Literally, that's all it is. The only difference you really get on the bike is, of course, the chain line difference and the extra mud clearance and stuff that you get on the back of the bike. So yeah, it doesn't matter if you've got boost in the back and none on the front. Oh, yeah. Basically, no difference. No difference. Uh, lo as long as whatever you're using is boost and boost, or not boost and not boost, on the front. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Then you're fine. Well, you can, although that said, <laughs> you, you can get converters, yeah. but it's never as good as running the full boost because the whole point is to have your hub flanges slightly wider to get a slightly stiffer mm -hmm. wheel. Regarding the use of roadie bib shorts under baggies, Neil is definitely right it's the best way to go. However, I've never found a combo where the baggies didn't slip down over the slippery lycra bibs. Any tips or recommendations? Um, well... Well, I've got one, straight out. Go on. It's not your one. <laughs> um, don't, don't, don't use lycra bibs underneath. He's wrong, they're not the best solution. The best solution is a bib liner, not a bib. A bib is made of lycra and therefore it's slippy, whereas a bib liner will be made of a mesh material and it still has the padding and it still has the bib. And you put your shorts on it, don't move. I am doing everything in my power to uh, not give bad advice. Yeah. Um, I he, doesn't even, he doesn't even like liners. I don't get involved, man. Do you know what you want? <laughs> you want some high quality saddle polish, then you just slip slide around on the saddle. Pants, shorts, jobs are good. <laughs> But he, his, his undercarriage must be like a bit of old beef jerky. If we go into yeah. this every, every episode, three, yeah, three shows in a row, it's been brought, people can't get over it. What? Rock and roll, baby. Leather gooch. Well, I'm, I've, I've got like Dwayne, Dwayne the Rock Johnson's forehead. Just, you know, leathery. Oh, <laughs> Anyhow, I will go on and say something actually sensible that is yep. okay advice. Yep. Some companies, I know Enduro used to do it, Gore still do it. A kind of a gridded interface on the pad which kind of mates together with the short yeah and will stop it going. stop it sliding around sometimes you yeah. see clickers and stuff yeah same with waistbands and that you get shorts have got like silicon gel and stuff on them mm -hmm. stop them in fact you could probably do a home hack with just some household silicon gel yeah, on a pair of shorts so that stuff sticks to anything yeah if you did one just that way line around and it. then on the other ones you did that way yeah you probably maybe you should do some clothing hacks that's a good idea actually yeah just experience freedom yeah D ditch ditch the chamois <laughs> I ride every day without a chamois, but if I go for a long ride, I'm definitely wearing a chamois. Oh, um, yeah, no worries. I don't mind a bit of long riding. Yeah. And, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no chamois. Everyone's going <laughs> to... Once you know it, you can never go back. <laughs> After your very long bike ride, we'll have the same conversation and see what you yeah, say. Yeah, see what goes on. See. All right, well, that's, that's all for this Q&A session. If you've got any questions about this session, um, by all means, get involved underneath. Ask your questions. Use the hashtag AskGMBNTech. Um, you can also send emails to hellotech at gmbn.com. Um, don't forget, when you subscribe, if you click that little bell button, it does mean you get a notification every time we have a new GMBN Tech video go live. So you don't even have to look on the internet. We tell you when it's available. Yeah. So uh, I'm just going to throw you to a little video down here. This one is about my bike cave uh, and all my nerdy stuff that's in there. You might like it, you might hate it. And I'm going to throw to Martin's random tandem bike check, hell of a bike which is one hell of a bike. And um, I think we should also add the small little finishing point. From now on, chamois questions. <laughs> we can have a content warning on because people don't want to know. No. I'm talking. I've had it in so many different terms this last week. I'm so sorry. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll leave it there. See you later, guys. <laughs>